the Baha'i world has entered a holy year commemorating the 100th anniversary of the passing of Baha'u'llah and the inauguration of his covenant. The holy year commenced with a 12-day festival of Rizvan on April 21st, when the elected administrative institutions of the faith are formed through the Baha'i electoral process. Twelve new national and regional spiritual assemblies were formed, bringing the six-year plan to a successful conclusion. The new national assemblies of Albania, Bulgaria, Poland, Azerbaijan, the Baltic states, Central Asia, Belarus, Moldova, and the Ukraine add to the list of countries of the former Eastern Bloc, where the Baha'i faith has spread rapidly over the last several years. The developing climate of religious freedom also spread to Africa, permitting long-awaited formations of national spiritual assemblies in Angola, the Congo Republic, and Niger. Concurrently, Baha'is in Uganda were able to gather again in the house of worship as a major cleaning and restoration project nears completion. In the far north, the Baha'is of Greenland enjoyed the company of the Hand of the Cause of God, Dr. Ali Muhammad Varga, as they formed their first national spiritual assembly, bringing the total number to 165. Meanwhile, in Iran, Mr. Bahman Samandari was arrested and executed, reminding the world once again of the continuing persecution of the long-suffering Baha'is in the birthplace of Baha'u'llah.
On the morning of May 28th, some 3,000 Baha'is converged at Bahji, the site of the ascension and subsequent interment of Baha'u'llah. It was the widest diversity of human beings imaginable, representing no less than 200 countries and dependent territories. Silently, reverently, they came. Left behind were the usual touristic accoutrements, cameras and video camcorders. For many old friends, reunions were limited to a smile, a nod, perhaps a few brief words. This was, above all else, a supremely sacred occasion, an experience described by many participants as simply ineffable. stirring emotion we gather in the hallowed environs of his resting place to honor the memory of the supreme manifestation of God Baha'u'llah on the solemn historic occasion of the centenary of his ascension for here at Bahji 100 years ago was drawn the last breath on earth of the world's greatest luminary, founder of the dispensation marking the culmination of the 6,000-year-old Adamic cycle, and inaugurator of the 5,000-century Baha'i cycle. King of kings, Lord of Lords, Supreme Mediator, Most Ancient Beauty. He is the well-beloved of all worlds. We hail him as the long-awaited promised one, the object of the adoration of the world. Today, a century later, it is we who identify ourselves with his community who have come in multitudinous array from the far corners of the earth to pay homage to the King of Glory. And among us, at this point of adoration, are a number of the heroic souls from the celebrated company who earned the accolade Knight of Baha'u'llah, conferred upon them by Shoghi Effendi, guardian of the cause. This to signify their acts of daring and devotion as teachers of the faith. It is they who were in the vanguard during the triumphant 10-year world crusade. Now, on this commemorative occasion, the roll of honor on which the names of the knights have been inscribed is being deposited by Amatul Baha Ruhiye Khanum at the entrance door of the most holy shrine in the spot designated by our beloved guardian. This is both a symbol and a promise a symbol registering the reality of a clear response at a critical time to the duty laid upon us by the Lord of hosts to diffuse his teachings among all peoples. A promise that the commitment so dazzlingly displayed by these intrepid pioneers will be reaffirmed by generations of their successors, ensuring that the light of Baha'u'llah's revelation shining in all its power and glory 
will have suffused and enveloped the entire planet. I've never seen in the gardens like this year. I'm sure that all of us have never seen them like this. Never been like this before. And I think that I noticed in um, Bulgaria, Poland, Bulgaria, and Albania, which we recently returned from, that uh, they had a phenomenal spring there too. Something about the spring of this year that's been extraordinary. I don't know about America, but in Europe it's been absolutely out of this world, here and everywhere else. And then look, of course, the extraordinary beauty and badge on this occasion. As midnight approached, some 6,000 candles were lit along the radial paths of the gardens and around the entire length of the great circular path marking the outer perimeter of the Harami Akdas. At the center, the mansion and the entire shrine of Baha'u'llah were bathed in light as the reverent throng silently gathered. Beloved friends, <clears throat> only once in about a thousand years, human beings have the privilege and joy of having walking among them a manifestation of God, of being able to have converse with one who is the perfect reflection of the eternal essence of God. Our immediate forebears had that privilege. And tonight we are met to recall that agonizing moment 100 years ago, when the earthly life of Baha'u'llah came to an end and the King of Kings was no longer with us on this earth. We recall his sufferings and his triumphs we register our awareness of the task to which he has called us. And we pay tribute both to the memory of his life and the power of his spirit which continues to sustain us. Now, in a few moments, the hands of the cause of God and the members of the Universal House of Justice will go to the room of Baha'u'llah in the mansion to pay homage on behalf of all who are gathered here and all his followers throughout the world. When we return to our places, the program of prayers and readings will begin, culminating in the chanting of the Tablet of Visitation. Then we shall solemnly circumambulate his holy shrine. As we return from this circumambulation, we shall all gradually disperse. Now we shall proceed to the room of Baha'u'llah.
The commemoration in Haifa was near the middle of a wave of 3 a.m. observances, beginning with the eastern Pacific Ocean and moving westward as the world turned on its axis. The praise which hath dawned from thy most august self and the glory which hath shone forth from thy most effulgent beauty rest upon thee, O thou who art the manifestation of grandeur and the King of eternity and the Lord of all who are in heaven and on earth. Millions of Baha'is in more than 100,000 localities remained wakeful through the night across all 24 time zones, ending with Western Samoa on the eastern edge of the international date line. Later that day, members of the Universal House of Justice led a procession up the nine terraces, known as the Path of the Kings, leading to the Shrine of the Bab. The abundant diversity in the procession bore witness to the achievements in the 40 years since the last holy year and to the growing maturity of the Baha'i community. Once past the Shrine of the Bab, the groups proceeded along the Ark Path to the seat of the Universal House of Justice, where upon entering the concourse, they viewed a life-size projection of the portrait of Baha'u'llah. While climbing Mount Carmel, visitors had a first-hand look at the construction projects on the terraces and the new buildings on the Ark. Feverish work was required to complete pouring of the new stairways just below the shrine where thousands of truckloads of rock are being moved to reshape the mountain to the contours of the new terraces. The rock is being removed from the massive excavation higher on the mountain for the center of the study of the texts and the archives extension. Meanwhile, work continues on the tall retaining wall needed to stabilize the side of the mountain and prevent rock slides. Timely completion of these terraces and the buildings on the Ark 
each of which will house a major institutional component of the rapidly developing world order of Baha'u'llah, is one of the great challenges facing the Baha'is of the world over the closing years of the century. As the Holy Year began, the Universal House of Justice noted that the Baha'i faith is increasingly being referred to as a major world religion now known to the most significant public institutions and prominent persons on earth. Of particular interest is Guyana, where the Baha'i community now comprises some 6% of the country's population. The activities of this busy community attracted the Prime Minister, the Honorable Hamilton Green, to attend Baha'i gatherings, meet with the National Spiritual Assembly, and to undertake, at the request of the President and his Cabinet, a formal state visit to the House of Worship in Wilmette. A primary purpose of his visit was to meet with a newly chartered Baha'i Medical Corps called Health for Humanity to discuss health projects. I wish to record and to use this opportunity and to say publicly our gracious thanks to the Baha'i National Body health-free humanity, and the many Baha'i enthusiasts who have, in significant ways, already contributed in the fields of health, education, and sports in Guyana's development. Prime Minister Green publicly praised the Baha'is at a dinner attended by prominent physicians and in an interview on Chicago because Public Radio prior to addressing the Baha'i friends gathered for the U.S. National Convention. We've been really overwhelmed and taken back by the measure of concern that you've shown. And from that, the Baha'is must be the quintessence of goodness and an anchor for the correct religious and social principles and practices we look for in the world. Amidst the high-tech splendor of the capital city of Brazil, the world's fifth largest country, the Federal Chamber of Deputies reverently convened a solemn plenary session to pay formal tribute to the founder of the Baha'i faith on the 100th anniversary of his passing. The universality, timeliness, and scope of the Baha'i faith justifies our coming to this plenary session to exalt the figure of Baha'u'llah, whose message embodies the most profound and beautiful religious doctrines of all people, of whatever nationality or belief. Mr. President, I find myself perplexed by the colossal religious work written by the pen of just one person elaborated under unimaginable conditions and embodying at one and the same time stylistic vigor, majestic authority, incomparable moral courage, abundant generosity, severe warnings, artistic beauty, and prophetic tone. Baha'u'llah, Mr. President, is the name of the author of this work. Although the name of the one we honor sounds exotic to our ears, certainly his message with all the beauty in it is not the least bit strange to the Brazilian people. The primordial will of God, he affirmed, is to effect a transformation in the character of humanity and to develop in the hearts of those who respond to his call the moral and spiritual qualities latent in human nature. I hereby pay my homage to this prophet who foresaw more than a century ago that humanity was moving toward unity. This session, I am certain, will remain in the memories of this chamber as one of the most significant of all those which this plenary has ever held. And it was really a, a tribute to the sacrifice of all the pioneers who came to Brazil, and uh, mainly to the spiritual mother of our 
country, Leonora Hosepo Armstrong, who in 1921 came to this country all by herself, alone, without knowing anyone, it started her uh, mission here at her pioneer post in Brazil. And how could she imagine that 71 years later, the Chamber of Deputies of this country, the federal capital, would give such a tribute to the founder of the faith that she loved so much. Immediately following the solemn session, the president of the chamber and other legislators joined officials of the Brazilian post office to formally launch a special cancellation stamp commemorating the centenary of the ascension of Baha'u'llah. The government of Trinidad and Tobago has also issued a postage stamp in recognition of the holy year. It was the country's worst urban violence in over 100 years. In the United States, the city of Los Angeles was well nigh consumed by the flames ignited by racial division on the ninth day of Rizvan. In sad fulfillment of Abdul Baha's prophetic warnings during his visit to the American continent 80 years ago, the city convulsed in agony under the pall of 5,000 fires, 44 deaths, 2,000 injuries, and $1 billion in property damage. Images of the turmoil were broadcast live to sickened audiences, punctuating the warnings of the Universal House of Justice of the serious dangers posed by the rise of racism in many parts of the world. The Baha'i community was not exempt from the effects. The Los Angeles Baha'i Center, purposefully located in a neighborhood of ethnic diversity, became the center of a firestorm as most of the buildings around it were left in charred ruins by angry mobs. Miraculously, the center itself survived the conflagration. In the aftermath, the Baha'is were quick to come to the aid of their neighbors. They quickly organized teams of volunteers to help clean up the tons of debris and to restore a sense of dignity to the barren urban landscape. Food and clothing giveaways help those most severely affected by the destruction. Baha'i psychologists organized free counseling services for neighborhood children and others feeling the trauma of witnessing civil and moral order evaporate before their very eyes. These events added a powerful impetus to the bold new initiatives for race unity launched over the last year in communities all across America. As a result, Baha'is are increasingly recognized as a leading force for solving racial problems. If they're united. I read the statement on race unity. For those of you who have not read it, may I recommend it to you. It is a beautiful statement. And it is very, very cogent. Read it. We thank God for the Baha'i community and for the contribution you make continually to each one of us. The National Assembly sent an open letter to the President of the United States, which was prominently published in New York, Washington, and Los Angeles newspapers. The letter strongly urged him to step up government efforts to address America's most challenging issue before the nation's cities are reduced to rubble. Meanwhile, Baha'i communities continued to work to unite the hearts of their fellow citizens at the local level. Baha'i communities have been asked by police departments, by mayors, by human relations commissions, by a state attorney general, by major corporations, and by a variety of other agencies to assist in a wide range of ways in eliminating racism and promoting race unity. In the Deep South, the Baha'i initiatives even managed to unite two separatist groups. The irony of the incident was so significant, it became the top story on the local TV news. What in the world would put about 30 members of the Ku Klux Klan side by side with these folks from the Pan-African International Movement? Spreading the word, no. 
The uniting force is these members of the American Baha'i Religious Group and their annual March for Race Unity Day. Baha'is believe in the unity of mankind, everyone's the same because God made us all. Marchers seem to have no problem with the uninvited guests. I'm glad that they had to get together to come protest us. <laughs> we did our job, we're bringing people together. There are about 300 marchers here. Organizers say this may be the single largest show of ethnic unity in Hillsborough County history. Baha'is are involved in the widest range of activities, in the service of their communities, to promote understanding, to bring groups together, and to demonstrate the models of racial, ethnic, and religious unity Baha'u'llah came to establish. Racism, just undo it. The United Nations Conference on Environment and Development convened in Rio de Janeiro in early June. Energized by the overwhelming imperative of the global environmental crisis, the conference, popularly known as the Earth Summit, was the largest gathering of world leaders ever assembled. For the first time in this century, the primary focus of the summit was not on war or economic conflict, but on people, preservation, and growth. Representatives from virtually every country on Earth were present as the leaders of nations great and small confronted problems that transcend all borders. Out of more than 1,400 non-governmental organizations accredited to the conference, only 12 were invited to speak to the plenary session of world leaders. President, Among these, the Baha'i International Community Lady was the Kim only Kim religious organization to the address Baha the gathering. Hanju Kim Farley was one of the few women to be heard. The fundamental spiritual truth of our age is the oneness of humanity. Universal acceptance of this principle with its implications for social and economic justice. Universal participation in non-adversarial decision-making, peace and collective security, equality of the sexes, and the universal education will make possible the reorganization and administration of the world as a one country the home of a humankind. Baha'is were also key participants in the Global Forum, a parallel conference of UN-affiliated NGOs held in Rio at the same time. The Baha'i International Community sponsored public symposia to consult on the spiritual practicalities of sustainable development. From the Baha'i perspective, civilization is progressive. And we view the function of the individual within their profession being to transform one's discipline, to bring the discipline into harmony with a global society. And so when we talk about leadership, I would like to incorporate the moral dimension. Uh, humanity is sick of words. They want to see action. So the Baha'i community wants to show it itself as a model for this action in more than 800 socioeconomic development projects in more than 60 countries. One Baha'i project was formally recognized at the conference. The Baha'i Vocational Institute for Rural Women received a prestigious Global 500 Award for eradicating guinea worm disease in a tribal district of India. The Institute's director explained how the Baha'i teachings helped break down barriers of caste prejudice that had previously interfered with literacy classes and health education. Through the most powerful writings like Hidden Words of Baha'u'llah, we find that women really get completely transformed and their hearts really change and they accept each other, they love each other, they want to learn each other's uh, songs and their dances and then they, they move around hand in hand and they love and they work together and a sort of unity is established at caste level and then they are very eager to learn literacy. Baha'i involvement in the two conferences extended to other areas as well. 
Baha'is were asked to organize and host a series of artistic presentations each evening in Flamingo Park. The programs were so emotive of the spirit of the conference that they were referred to as the heart and soul of the Global Forum. At times, readings from Baha'i scripture were interspersed between performances. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Be united as the fingers of one hand, the limbs of one body. The Baha'i International Community sponsored a children's art and writing contest on the subject of the environment. The results were displayed at the forum and published in a book which was presented to the heads of state and NGO representatives by UNICEF officials. That's uh, why I'm really highly satisfied, satisfied from, by this uh, sensibility showed by I. And I hope that in, uh, our, our partnership could develop further in the future. Twelve-year-old May Eshragi was Australia's official representative at the Global Children's Hearing attended by many prominent environmental experts. 30 Baha'i youth assisted the Tree of Life project, where action pledges from around the world were compiled and displayed. Volunteers at the Baha'i information booth gave out over 7,000 pieces of literature each day. The Baha'i presence here is very, very profound. I, I would dare to say that it is the most visible and the most uh, in-depth and, and known of any non-governmental organization on the planet. One of the most important Baha'i contributions was somewhat less obvious. We have uh, attempted to be a unifying force in this effort. We are, are um, we have tried in all arenas to be a, a source of unity among the various parties, both non-governmental and governmental. And second, to uh, contribute Baha'i principles wherever, uh, it, uh, wherever it seemed appropriate. Perhaps the most visible Baha'i contribution to the Earth Summit was the Peace Monument. This five meter high concrete structure in the shape of an hourglass serves as a reminder that the time for global change is running out. Engraved on all four sides are Baha'u'llah's words, the earth is but one country and mankind its citizens. All the countries participating in the global forum were invited to bring a kilogram of earth from their homelands to be placed inside the hourglass as a symbolic gesture of universal participation in achieving world peace. The beauty of the monument attracted Brazilian television and radio networks. Reporters often use the site for live broadcasts during the conference. The sculptor, who is not a Baha'i, insisted that the calligraphic symbol of the name of Baha'u'llah be inlaid on the top of the monument, which is prominently situated under the landing pattern of Rio's international airport. This monument was conceived by Ciron Franco, which is a Brazilian artist from the Midwest of Brazil, and he's known worldwide by his artistic work. And just today, he, in an interview, alive in a radio, declared his faith to Baha'u'llah. On the last day of the conference, as the final ceremonial act of the Global Forum itself, the Queen of New Zealand, UN officials and other dignitaries gathered to dedicate the sculpture. The vials of earth from all over the planet were poured together into the hourglass, completing the composition of a striking artistic achievement. Profoundly significant in its symbolic representation of the role of the Baha'i faith, at this critical juncture in human history. Vanuatu is a small chain of islands in the Melanesian archipelago, a place where traditional lifestyles and beliefs have endured.
Councillor Molly Chang is a traditional chief among his Samoan people and an ardent Baha'i teacher whose forebears carried the Christian teachings to other islands in the Pacific. In keeping with these traditions, this Samoan chief was invited to participate in a reenactment of the arrival of Christianity and to formally present the new teachings to the traditional chiefs of the islands. Today, Baha'u'llah has come. The holy manifestation of God. He was sent by God to this world to unite mankind, to put us together in true love and harmony. One such visit took place at Enketala, the home of Chief Bangota, one of the most respected chiefs on the island of Tana. And he told us that now he gave the key to us. We have the key now. Before he has it, he has the key. All Tana listen to him. Whatever he says, all Tana follows. But today, he gave it to us. Give it to us. One week later, Chief Bangota formally declared his belief in Baha'u'llah. There are some prophecies in some sort of belief that the islanders believe. And they were waiting for this thing. They don't know what, but they still waiting until today. And when they saw us, they saw the chief, Oli Chan, come in. They said, this is the day. This is what we are waiting for. That's why he said, I give you the key.
May the 29th, 1992. Baha'is from all over the United Kingdom set out for the new Southgate Cemetery in North London for the national commemoration of the centenary of the ascension of Baha'u'llah. Disregarding an unexpected change in the weather, believers from as far afield as Scotland, France and the Netherlands made an early start towards the resting place of Shoghi Effendi. Two hours before the start of the commemorative service, a special display of relics associated with the person of Baha'u'llah was opened for viewing. The archives exhibited in the cemetery's chapel included one of Baha'u'llah's robes and a lock of his hair. By one o'clock, the rain had stopped and more than 2,300 visitors, more than double the number expected, had gathered in the vicinity of the Guardian Shrine to commemorate the ascension of Baha'u'llah. The programme, based on the selection of readings which had been circulated by the Universal House of Justice and used in Haifa earlier that same day, lasted a little under one hour, the whole period of which was marked by a solemn and respectful atmosphere. I bear witness, moreover, and through the word from thee, thou hast decided between all creation... When the service was over, members of the National Spiritual Assembly led the children who had attended their own programme in a circumambulation of the Guardian's resting place, followed by the rest of the visitors gathered at the commemoration. The national public commemoration for the ascension of Baha'u'llah took place at the prestigious Commonwealth Institute in London on the 11th of June. One of the major events of the holy year, it was attended by prominent people from all areas of society. Despite a security alert which disrupted the transport services and delayed the invited guests, the large hall gradually filled up. All the dignitaries received a rose with their programme. The evening was organised by the National Spiritual Assembly and the Baha'i Information Office. The programme was a dignified mixture of words and music about Baha'u'llah. The professionalism of the Baha'i Choir was particularly appreciated by the receptive audience. The hall was addressed by the Secretary General of the National Spiritual Assembly, who spoke very directly about Baha'u'llah and his station. After the program, while light refreshments were being served, Baha'is and their guests engaged further in discussion about the faith. The United Kingdom's National Convention was this year characterised by a highly spiritual atmosphere that moved many of the Baha'is and their guests to tears. Held in the Welsh seaside town of Llandidno from the 24th to the 26th of April, National Convention was seen to be an appropriate start to the Holy Year. The election of the National Spiritual Assembly took place with a significant number of youth being among the delegates for the first time. Among the events that made the convention special were a spectacular commemoration service dedicated to Baha'u'llah, with a Welsh male voice choir performing alongside the National Baha'i Choir in the presence of the local mayor, and a touching memorial service in memory of Charles MacDonald, a long-serving member of the National Spiritual Assembly, who stood down from the body at Rizvan 1991 for health reasons. The moving presentation was led by relatives of Charles MacDonald. Teaching a large number of waiting souls who long to hear about the faith is an easy task at the Mind, Body and Spirit exhibition in London. The National Teaching Committee has been exhibiting at this annual event for more than a decade, giving the Baha'is a chance to experience the excitement of meeting a keen and highly receptive audience. This year, the Baha'i Publishing Trust had their own stand at the Mind, Body and Spirit exhibition for the first time, and the Baha'i presence was also enhanced by music and dance from Vision, the Baha'i Performing Arts Group appearing for its second year at this important exhibition.
Mention the Baha'i faith in the media and you may think of small adverts in the classified columns of local newspapers proclaiming the earth is but one country and offering a telephone number if you want to know more. But things have changed and are likely to carry on changing. The faith is now being presented and represented on network television channels, national radio services and prominent newspapers. There are two main reasons for the change. Firstly, the media has echoed society's increased awareness of the Baha'is and has made itself more accessible to the faith. Also, Baha'is, realising this is a powerful tool for proclamation, have taken a professional attitude to how they use the media and are producing high-quality programming about the faith. The pace of this change has been particularly fast in the former Eastern Bloc countries. In Russia, a one-hour cinema film about the faith was financed and produced by non-Baha'is. The film presented the principles of the faith and gave a portrait of Baha'i society. Developments that would have been unthinkable five years ago are now becoming reality. The newly formed National Assembly of Czechoslovakia had the foresight to commission a television commercial for the Czech language version of the book The Earth is But One Country. The advert briefly explained the Baha'i principles and invited people to purchase and read the book if they wanted to learn more. The same commercial could not be shown on television in the United Kingdom because it's not yet permitted to advertise religions or religion-related products on television. However, it's not just in Eastern Europe where the Baha'is are gaining airtime. The National Assembly of Portugal was invited to produce a half-hour programme every six months for broadcast on network television. These transmissions have been very popular and have attracted a large number of inquirers. The third of the series was recently shown the previous two programs included pieces on the concept of progressive revelation and the history of the faith, as well as a profile of the present global Baha'i community. As a direct response to the commemoration events in Haifa, the well-known Baha'i singer Ahdiye Pakravan was invited onto Spanish television to speak about the faith and sing Baha'i songs. The Holy Year has also been the inspiration for the production by Baha'is of a number of documentaries about Baha'u'llah. One of these, being produced by Fourth Epoch Productions, is very near to completion. The 45-minute programme is intended for distribution via video and television throughout the world. It begins with the story of the life of Baha'u'llah and concludes by showing how Baha'u'llah's message has been adopted by society. The programme is the result of a collaboration between the Baha'i-owned video production company and Baha'i television professionals from France. The final programme will hopefully be viewed by millions of people throughout the world over the coming months. Proclamation via the mass media was of course inevitable. However, the pace at which it came and at which it's increasing can only continue to amaze and to inspire.